I just want to let everyone know, Marlene loves when you whistle at her. <laughs> I heard that back there. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> just whistling. I love this church. I'm going to stay here for a little bit longer. <laughs> So it's great seeing everyone. Before we get into what we're going to get into today, um, I need your help with something. This is really, really important. We are in desperate need of candy, okay? Now, Pastor Ron has sent me a very angrily worded text message last night saying, you and Pastor Mike dropped the ball. You have to get more candy. Now, listen, this is really important. So I'm going to ask Kieran at the cafe. I know we have a full house up here at the cafe. How many of you brought candy already for the harvest party? Raise your hand, okay? There's, there's a, a good bit of you in here and at the cafe. Okay, now listen. How many of you, because of your devotion to Jesus and your love for children and your care of the church would say, this week, I'm going to commit to bringing some candy. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Look at those hands. Now, here's what we want to do for the people that just made that commitment. We want you to turn around and look at all the other people that brought candy and say, come on, can't you bring a little bit more? Can you just please bring a little bit more? Okay. Now here, here's why this is important, folks, because the Harvest Party is the bit, one of the biggest events that we do all year, if not the biggest event. Now, this is an event that just goes beyond our church. We have a ton of families that visit from different parts of the city, a ton of uh, children, and we serve them. And the question that we get a lot when people come up to register their children is, how much does this cost? It's absolutely free. Free. And we provide dinner for them. We have hot chocolate there. There's cookies and snacks. On top of that, we have every child that comes gets a bag of candy. And I'm talking about good candy. They sort it. They give it to the kids. A bag of candy. And it's all for free. And it's a service to the community. So this really means a lot. And we couldn't do that without your generosity. So please, in advance, we thank you for uh, bringing as much candy as you can. And get the, don't get the, like the little bag. Get the bag that you're embarrassed to buy at Sam's Club, the one that you're like, I don't want people to think that I'm going to eat this, but bring that bag. So we thank you for that. All right. Now, all right. I, I don't know why you're plotting that. It's like, I guess it's a good thing to do. Um, we're going to talk today about a subject. Now, all seriousness, this is really serious. So I uh, feel that God has very strongly put this subject on my heart. And there was a movie in 2002 that came out, and Tom Cruise was in it. It's called Minority Report. And it's set in the future. I didn't see the movie, but I, I remember reading about it. The, the premise is this. It's set in the future, and essentially, crimes are policed by thoughts. And so if somebody's about to commit murder, they can trace the thoughts of a person and they go and they arrest that person based on their thoughts. Okay, so this is, you know, future thinking. Now, the, the message that God wanted me to tell you before we even get out of the gate on this sermon is this. You are here today, and some of you need to hear this. I am here to try to stop you from becoming murderous. And I mean that. I am here to stop you from the thoughts that you've been having and the spirit that we're going to be examining today, because this is such a big deal. It's such a big problem, and we have to look at it dead on and really examine our hearts to see where this spirit is taking us. Last, uh, two weeks ago, we started a series called The Strong Man, and we talked about these attitudes, these demonic ideas that keep us from what God has for us. Today, we're going to examine the spirit of jealousy. Spirit of jealousy. Now, there's a lot that the Bible says about jealousy, specifically in Galatians chapter 5. The apostle Paul equates jealousy. He says the works of the flesh, one of them is jealousy. And when we see in the Bible that the works of the flesh or the acts of the flesh or the behaviors of the flesh, attitudes, when you see something of the flesh, what that means is this is an attitude or a behavior that takes place in us apart from Jesus. It's something that we naturally do that's evil. And one of which is the spirit of jealousy. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of different points where this is going to hit you. First of all, this message I really believe is going to hit a lot of younger people today because the millennial generation and younger, okay, and I'm a millennial, I'm talking all the way down to the younger generations, okay, 
the millennial generation, the Southern Baptist Convention president, J.D. Greer, just released a uh, report this week, and he said millennials struggle with depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts, and um, anger more than just about any generation. This is a scientific study that, they, that he read online, okay? So this is a, a very, very big problem. And the reason why, I'm going to speculate as to why millennials and younger struggle with these feelings more is because we have an ultra-connected generation. We don't know life without the technology of the internet and that instant connectivity. And there's some dark sides to that that maybe we're not examining. So we're going to look at why that is because of the spirit of jealousy, spirit of jealousy. So let's look, let's take a little bit of a a look back at this. Now, it's not just a millennial problem. I was talking to somebody all morning. I I had somebody come up to me in in between the services. They stopped me at the door and they said, you know, I I really needed to hear this. And they were in their, I would say mid fifties. And they're like, you have no idea how big of a problem this is for me in my life and the way I view my life. And I just didn't realize what it was. And today you're going to realize that. So this covers all bases. So look with me, if you will, in first John chapter three, verse 12. John tells us, we should not be like Cain, who was the, of the evil one, and he murdered his brother. And why did he murder his brother? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. The message version of the Bible is interesting on this. It says the reason why Cain murdered his brother is because he was deep in the practices of evil. Now, I'm going to speculate that some of you right now here at the cafe on Facebook that are watching, some of you are deep in the practices of evil. And that evil is the evil of jealousy, the spirit of jealousy. So we want to look at what I call the demonic devastation of comparison because that's where jealousy begins, the demonic devastation of comparison. It's when we compare our lives to the lives of those that are around us, those on social media. And why is it a problem in this generation? Because all you have to do right now, all you have to do, if you want to compare your life to someone, take out your phone, go, well, my phone's now talking to me. That's not a good, let's not do this again. Just started randomly speaking. So you take out your phone, you click a button, and you can see your 10 greatest friends, what's going on in the highlights of their life, their, their dates that they're going on, what's going on with their family. You can see that so easily. And what happens is the spirit of jealousy is at the door and we compare ourselves to other people. So let me talk about comparison, the demonic devastation of comparison and what comparison does. Let's look at four areas together here today. Number one, comparison destroys contentment. Comparison destroys contentment. Let's look at the Cain and Abel story. Now let's figure out who, where did Cain and Abel come from? Okay. What's the name of Cain and Abel's parents? What's their names? What's the name of Cain and Abel's parents? One more time. Adam and Eve, right? Who are Adam and Eve? They were the first humans ever. Okay. First created people on the planet. All right. So we have Adam and Eve. Okay. Genesis one, Genesis two, everything is perfect. God's creating stuff, creates the world, creates the stars, hangs in the firmament, all the beautiful animals. We see that God created all the animals. It doesn't say that God created cats. I'm still kind of curious as to where cats came from. I know they're not from God. All right. So it says that God created all these things. All right. Some cat people here are a little upset. It's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll forgive you. We can analyze that later. So God creates all this stuff. And then Genesis chapter one and two are perfect. Then Genesis chapter three, we see Adam and Eve decide to sin against God. When they sin against God, the world becomes cursed. The world that we're living in right now, as you're sitting here is cursed, it's still cursed. That hasn't ended yet. Now we live in the world But Jesus said he's overcome the world. But Jesus didn't say that we weren't going to be free from the world's curse. Not yet. So Adam and Eve have this problem. Then after they're living in this cursed world, they have children. Cain and Abel. Cain's the older. Cain and Abel. So we see this sibling connection going on. And you've heard of Cain and Abel. You know the story. You know what happens. But I guarantee you you haven't looked at in this spin. So comparison destroys contentment. Look with me in Genesis chapter 4 verse 5. Cain and Abel are giving an offering to God. Abel's was accepted 
Cain's was not. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, but for Cain in his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So Abel offers up a gift to God. Cain offers up a gift to God. God loves Abel's offering. God despises Cain's offering. And the Bible says that Cain's face fell. It's that simple. If you are comparing yourself to other people, it gets into your system. People know what you're doing, okay? You can't hide it from people. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. The Bible says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Okay? So you can't hide this. It doesn't matter how smooth you are. Right now, some of you, you're comparing yourself to other people, and people around you know that you're discontented. It has robbed you of your contentment. Your comparison has robbed you of your contentment. I'm going to tell you an embarrassing, transparent story here, okay? Here's the story. Uh, it was like 2007. I, Jamie and I had just gotten married. We were looking for a house. Now, I don't know if you watch HGTV and those things where the couples go and they look at the houses and it's great. That's literally the opposite of what it's really like. That's not true at all. You know, Jamie and I were arguing and I'm not bad arguing, but like, you know, she wanted crazy things. Like she wanted houses that had complete floors. I liked cheap houses that didn't have floors. And so, you know, we, we had to compromise on figuring out what to do. So we were looking for months and we were just newly married and we we were trying to figure out where to live. We lived in this little apartment that was, it was a great time in our life, but it was tough. So while we were going over, the, you know, this turmoil of, of going over this stuff, um, I was at a McDonald's lunch with uh, one of my closest friends. I'll tell you, I'm going to tell this service and on Facebook, and I didn't tell this to any other services. Okay, so we were at an office staff lunch. It was me, Pastor Mike, Pastor Ron, all right? And Pastor Ron comes in and he goes, hey guys, guess what happened last night? And me and Pastor Mike are like, what? And he said, I bought a house. And guess what? My stomach dropped. I was mad because I'm like, I want a house. Okay. So literally and Pastor Mike said, oh, that's great. And Pastor Ron, and Pastor Ron didn't know I was talking about him until this sermon. Okay. This service. So, so I'm just outing that. So uh, I, Ron was telling us about the house and it was a rental house and he was doing, and so I wanted to do that, but it took him literally 3.5 seconds to find a house. And Jamie and I have been looking for like six months. So I just had this feeling. So I, I got up from the table while he was talking to Pastor Mike about the house. And I went and I ordered another milkshake because I eat my feelings. Okay. So I went to the, to the milkshake counter. I come back and, you know, I'm like, oh, that's good. You got a house or whatever. So we were leaving and Pastor Mike stopped me. He's like, what's going on with you? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, what's going on? You seem like really sad or whatever. I was like, I, I want a house. Like I, I've been looking and I can't find any. And I, I, it's just, I feel like it's not right because he bought a house. And uh, how come I can't have a house? And Pastor Mike straight up rebuked me. He was like, do not think this way. He's like, the only way God is going to allow you to be content and happy is if you first celebrate the good that's going on in the lives of other people. You cannot allow that spirit to you know, get into you. So he was like really, really harsh with me. So I went back to the milkshake counter, got another milkshake <laughs> because now I was sad for another reason. And then what I did was I went home and I, I, I repented. I mean that. I repented and I said, God, why do I feel this way? It has nothing to do with me, whether or not he buys a house. I'm happy. He's one of my closest friends. And it changed overnight. Literally overnight, God freed me from this. So we have a, a, a motto in the office. And this is a Pastor Mike and Sam thing. And I, I, you know, this is kind of what we do. We want to be, and I want you to aim for this, to be the kind of person that people aren't afraid to show their new car to. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you ever buy a new car? Do you get a new house? Or do you go on a nice vacation? And you're really excited and you got all those stories. But you can't tell a lot of people, can you? You can't share that. Now, you have family members that love you and they care about you. You might have a sibling that, oh, that's great, you went away. But as soon as you start telling them about your windfall, as soon as you start telling them about the promotion that you got, you could see in their face that... It's bothering them. You want to be that kind of person because if you're not, not only do people know it, but you're not going to be content with anything because comparison destroys contentment. It says Cain's face fell. 
Next of all, we see comparison removes accountability. Comparison removes accountability. Cain is sulking. He's sad. He's upset. God comes and speaks to him. Look with me in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. It says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? Now, when we see in Scripture that God asks a question, it's never for God's benefit. God is not scratching his head going, I wonder what's up with, like, what's going on with Cain? He seems like a little, no, this is for Cain. This is so Cain recognizes the problem. God already knew what was going on inside of Cain's heart. God already knew what the problem was, but Cain didn't know. So God says, Cain, what's going on? Why is your face fallen? Why are you broken? What happened? And this is, this next verse, this part of the verse, in my opinion, if you're going to circle, underline, take note, write anything, this is what you want to write. And this is the part that you want to focus on because this is the antidote. God kind of gives him the antidote for how to quit comparing yourself to other people. And this is what he says. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? He says, if you do, just go and do well. That's what that means. Just go and do, you know what the right thing to do is. You know what the right thing, like don't focus on Abel. Abel's doing what Abel's doing. I want you to focus on you. I want you just to do good. I want you just to listen to me and do good. But the problem is when we compare ourselves to other people, we remove the accountability that we should be putting on ourselves for the behaviors that put us in a place that we never wanted to be. Okay, so Cain isn't asking God, you know, I don't know where this offering thing went wrong. I thought I was doing good. I mean, I thought I, thought I gave you a really good offering. I don't know where I went wrong. He's not asking where I went wrong. He's saying, why should Abel's be accepted? Why is Abel doing well? And when we think like that, we remove all accountability for our bad behavior. Then nothing's ever your fault. <laughs> How am I going to get ahead of my workplace? There's all these other people and they like, they know what to do. They know what to say. They're all political and they, they brown nose and they do all that stuff. And of course they're going to get ahead. I'm not going to get ahead. We remove the accountability for our behavior. Oh, look at that person. Look at how good they're getting along with their spouse and they're going on the weekend to remember and they're, you know, having all those fun Christian conversations and they love each other. Look at me. I, I don't have that. I can't have that in my marriage because I'm not sappy like that, but you're not focusing on why your marriage is a mess. You're not accountable accountable for the behaviors that put you in the position that has led you to discontentment. God's telling Cain, look, just focus on you, man. You can do well. If you do well, it'll be good, but you're not doing well. And comparison removes accountability. That's what happens on Facebook so much. We look at people and, you know, and I just had somebody say this, you know, they were like, well, this person, they get to go on three, five, six, seven vacations a year. I can't go on that many times. I can't have this kind of car. I can't afford that. I can't have a, a cabin. I can't have a lake house. And this is, well, why don't you ask yourself instead, what do I have to do to have the budget or the time or the resources to do what that person is doing? This has nothing to do with that person. This has everything to do with my own lack of satisfaction with what's going on in my life. And when we compare ourselves to other people, we remove that accountability. And Facebook does this repeatedly because we compare everybody else's stories. Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You know, people talk about, oh, look at, look at how good this person looks and look at how, how well this is put. You know, some of those pictures are filtered, folks. Okay. I've seen the filters. They have all sorts of filters. And some people, you need to use more filters. <laughs> okay. Not you, other people, not you. But really, I mean, you're only seeing, and this is a Stephen Furtick thing. This is what Stephen Furtick says. He says that we compare our behind the scenes to everybody else's highlight reel. And that's what we do. We compare like our struggle, our worst day to everybody else's best day. Now remember, you're looking at a picture, probably one of 600. You don't see the picture of the kids being angry and the picture crying, fighting, hitting each other. You don't see the kids in timeout. You see that perfect family portrait it took six and a half hours to get, all right? 
and you're thinking of your own kids. You see that new person's car and that minivan and leather, and you can tell that it smells, it smells good. It smells like new car, and they get the kids out of there, and your car just smells like kids. Like everything in my house and my car and everything just smells like kids. Like when you pass, I'm afraid when people pass me, because I have two little ones. I'm afraid when people pass me in the street, like, oh, that guy, he smells like kids. Because that's all I smell like, okay? <laughs> but you're comparing their, your life to their life. You're comparing what they want you to see with what you don't want others to see. And what happens is it removes the accountability of your behavior and your desire to act on the things that you're unsatisfied with your life. And it's a really bad situation. God says, just do well. Just do well. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Look at what the next part of this is. Comparison breeds evil. Comparison breeds evil. God continues speaking to Cain. And I love the fact that even though Cain is in such sin, God reaches out to him still. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, this is what he says. If you, will do, not, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. He says to Cain, look, if you don't get your act together and just focus on you and just focus on doing what I want you to do, there's something sinister going on here. There's something nefarious going on here. There's a sin that is at the door. And this sin is crouching to consume you. And this sin is evil. It's breeding. It's growing. And if you don't get it under control, Cain, it's going to consume you. I'm going to make an accusation that some of you, your lives are greenhouse breeding sin because of the attitude that you have towards other people. It's growing. It's attacking your life. It's attacking your health. You can't enjoy anything. And you're not recognizing it for what it is. It's not just you're having a bad day. It's not just you having a bad attitude. It's evil. It's evil because it doesn't even matter right now that God's giving Cain the prescription of how to do well. Cain doesn't care if he does well or not. Cain just wants Abel to suffer. And let's be honest. When we compare ourselves to others, sometimes we don't even care if things are going well in our lives. We just don't want them to do well. You know what that's called? That's called hatred. You know what Jesus said? He said that if you carry hate in your heart for your brother, it's the same as committing murder. In God's perspective. That's why I said very seriously that some of you right now, you're murderous. Because you hate those around you that are doing well. And you you equate your dissatisfaction with your own life and say, well, if this person was doing bad, then I would be doing better. But that simply is just not true. And you've allowed evil to breed. You've allowed evil to breed because you're not focusing on yourself. You're focusing on other people. When in fact, we see in Galatians chapter six, that each one of us should focus on our own work. We should focus on our own lane, what we should be doing. Comparison breeds evil. You don't want to do well yourself. That's not going to satisfy you now. Not at all. Oh no, you want that person to hurt. You want them to hurt. And that's evil. It's been bred by a spirit of comparison. It's demonic. God said it was demonic in the second generation. God said it's demonic to the children of the perfect parents. And God still says that it's demonic. And it's more prevalent now than it's ever been. Lastly, comparison hijacks your behavior. Comparison hijacks your behavior. Genesis chapter four, verse eight, what inevitably happens? You know what happens. It says, after God gets done speaking to Cain, didn't really do much good for Cain. It says, Cain spoke then to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and he killed him. That's it. He killed him. It took just a little bit of time from that festering, breeding sin that was in his mind to transfer so much in his heart, he couldn't hear from God, didn't listen to God, and now he has become the first ever recorded, premeditated, 
rage-inspired murderer. He's a murderer. And what's interesting is, and we don't want to make too big of a deal of this, but it's kind of something to consider. The word for killed in Hebrew has three different meanings. Of course, there's murder, which is the simplest one. Second is judiciary execution. And the third meaning is an animal sacrifice. There's something here where I could picture Cain saying, oh, you liked, or you liked Abel's animal sacrifice. You liked that blood sacrifice. Okay, God, I'll give you another blood sacrifice. I'll give you a blood sacrifice. You enjoy that so much? Here he is. And he callously walks away from his brother's dead body, away from the conversation that God was having with him, so consumed by a spirit of jealousy, consumed by a spirit of rage, hatred, comparison. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 it says, The Lord said to Cain, Where's Abel? Where's your brother? Again, do you think God knows where Abel is? I hope so. I hope you think that. This isn't for Cain, or this isn't for God. This is for Cain. He says, where's your brother? And you know what Cain says? (laughs) He said, my brother, I don't know. (laughs) My brother, am I my brother's keeper? Did you not just tell me a little bit ago just to do well and not worry about Abel? Why would I know where Abel is? Do you see? He is not repentant. He is not worried. He is not concerned. He is still still so sin sick because comparison has utterly hijacked his behavior. He is now consumed with rage and the scope of the consequences on his life for the rest of his life go beyond the preaching of this sermon. But he's summoned to consequences because of what he's done. And some of us, we pay the price for the consequence of comparison routinely and repeatedly because it destroys us and it influences our behavior. It only takes a little bit of time. Now, some of you, you might think it's innocent what you're doing, but I assure you it's not. You may think that Cain is keeping a good secret here, but Charles Swindoll rightly says that a secret on earth is a scandal in heaven. God knows exactly what's on your heart. He knows exactly what's in your mind. He knows exactly the thoughts that you have that are causing you to be sick when someone else is doing well. So God doesn't want you just to say, oh, I'm just having a bad week, a bad day. God wants you to rule over them. He wants you to do well. He wants you to rule over them. So what do we do? First of all, that might be you. Are you jealous? Is there someone right now when you think of your own life and you compare yourself to them, do you feel like you hate how well they've done? Do you feel like you hate that they got that car or that they have that marriage or that they have that experience? Do you hate that? Then what do we do with the spirit of Cain? Because you, my friend, are struggling with the spirit of Cain, the spirit of jealousy, the spirit of comparison. What do we do? Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus says, whatsoever you bind on this earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. How do we bind the strong man of jealousy? How do we kill the spirit of comparison? It's simple. There's two things. Number one, the first is you recognize the good work that God is doing in you. Recognize the good work that God is doing in you. Yes, God is doing good work in you. Absolutely, God is doing good work in you. I don't care what's going on in your life. You need to know that God is at work in your life. How do I know? How can I be so general? How can I speak in such generality? It's real simple. Because of the gospel. The gospel. Gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, died for our sin-sick soul. He not only forgave us our sin, he not only bore our shame, he not only took our sin away from us, but he exchanged our sin for his righteousness. So no matter what happens in your life on this earth, the fact that you can walk around cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, washed by his righteousness, you always have something good that you can proclaim that God has done. You always have something good that you 
you can testify of the goodness that God is doing in your life just because of Jesus. You know, one thing is for sure. You might be focusing and miserable right now because you're focusing on somebody else's good things. You might be miserable because you're focusing on something despairing that you have in your life that's going on, and that's why you're comparing. But the bottom line is this. When you compare yourself to others, you certainly aren't focused on the gospel. You're certainly not focused on Jesus and the work of the cross and the beauty of the empty tomb and the power of the victory of the resurrection. All of that is good work. But God goes even beyond that in our lives, doesn't he? He's constantly working. He's constantly transforming us into the person he's called us to be. Recognize the good work that God is doing in you. Next of all, compare yourself only to a past or future version of yourself. Don't compare yourself to another person. Don't compare yourself to the triathlon athlete that does a lot of stuff and they're exercising all the time and you've never even stepped into a gym, you've never even done that. That's not your lane and that's okay. But what you should do is you should compare yourself to who you might be, compare yourself to who you once were and see what can God do here? What does God want to do here? What does God want to change here? Look for opportunities. If you compare yourself only to you, then you enable God to give you a vision of your life that you might not have yet. So compare yourself only to a past or a future version of yourself. I know you're not where you want to be. I know that you're upset because your life isn't the way it is. But one thing I know for sure, if you know Jesus, you are not where you used to be. You are not at the end. God is still at work. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 Paul writes, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind me, and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. That's a straining where you're looking only forward. You're looking only upward. You're not looking left or right. You're looking at yourself. You're looking at God and you're focusing on what he's doing. Jesus died not to give you a standard to live up to that's next to you. Jesus died to free you from the bondage of jealousy and to give you the freedom to pursue him to the life that he has called you to live in his power. God is working. Only focus on him. Only focus on his work and forget what's going on in the lives of others. Be excited about the work that God is doing in the lives of others and then be content in the work that God is doing in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this message, this spirit of comparison. We pray that every single person here at the cafe, online, on Facebook, I pray that right now that we would submit to you to the point where the spirit of comparison and jealousy is put away, is cast out. Father, I pray for every single person here at the cafe, on Facebook, if you do not know Jesus as your savior, if the gospel has not transformed you, if you still consider that you are lost and you're trying to earn your way to God, I want you just to pray this prayer with me at this time. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the work that God is doing in your heart right now. Just pray with me. My heavenly father, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus died for me. He gave his life so that I could find mine. I believe Jesus rose from the grave and in him I have victory. I accept his forgiveness. I turn from my sin and I ask that you would allow me to walk in newness of life. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time and you met it, I want you to write that on your connection card and let us know that you did that. But now, Father, we thank you and we praise you for the power of the work that you do in our lives. I pray that you would give us the spirit of contentment and that we would bind the spirit of jealousy. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.